Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Austin Prep Presents. I'm Jennifer Hodgden. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations and Giving here at Austin Prep. Um, today, we are joined by Andrew Gazoulis from the class of 1999, as well as Nick Reynolds and Jess Lency, who are our, our, our health uh, what is the health counselors, health and wellness counselors. How about that? <laughs> um, today's topic for Austin Prep Presents is the road to recovery, the power of possibility. And um, I am going to um, welcome Andrew and Nick and Jess and allow you to say a few words about yourselves and then, um, and then I will get the program rolling. So Andrew, how about we start with you? Great. Um, let me start off by saying uh, thank you for having me. Um, you know, due to COVID reasons, obvious reasons, uh, this can't be in person. Um, it's actually maybe a nice transition uh, back to Austin Prep. Um, as I mentioned before, I was uh, not, I was asked not to attend the graduation. <laughs> and I wondered if possibly I would ever uh, go back to Austin Prep, as they say. Um, and so this is a, this is a real, uh, a, a, an honor for me to, to be invited back uh, to speak on some, you know, real life issues, uh, some things that I've been through and share my experience. Um, but um, my current position, uh, I'm a chemist and a production manager with Coatings to Go. Uh, it's a small coatings manufacturer uh, for medical devices uh, in, in Carlisle, Massachusetts. Uh, we ship all over the world, but um, our, our main specialty is making things, uh, you know, single use implants or single use medical devices, uh, very, very slippery so they can do as little damage uh, to the human body. Uh, as possible while they're, while they're being used. And so we have a little special spec ops team. We're a small company, but we have a little spec ops team that we go out and, uh, you know, help uh, engineers, help uh, other chemists and other uh, big companies, um, you know, may help make their devices better. Um, I was actually looking through my uh, CV uh, on online and um, I completely forgot that, uh, um, you know, I, I, t I titled this Power Possibility. Um, since uh, returning to college uh, and, and, you know, getting into recovery, uh, it's pretty amazing what you can do. Uh, I was actually the student of the year at USM in 2017, which I completely forgot about until I looked down uh, on the Coding Studio website and I was like, oh, oh yeah, <laughs> whoa. <Yeah. laughs> my, uh, my mug was on the website. <laughs> I kept out and apologize to everybody because they're like, because I'll say every time I log in, man, it's your, your chubby cheeks there. <laughs> but um, yeah, I graduated uh, with a degree in chemistry back in 2017 uh, as a mid 30 year old uh, going back to college. It was kind of kind of exciting and intimidating, uh, but, um, you know, a, a very great uh, experience. Uh, and then I got my master's in policy planning and management at the school, uh, Muskie School of Public Service, uh, which is also University of Southern Maine uh, in 2018. And I started with Codings to Go um, January 2nd of 2019. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, and I've been there since, uh, looking to um, assume the the helm uh, at the end of the year. So I'll be making president shortly, and then actually buying the wow. company. Um, Congratulations! Thank you. So it's uh, it's pretty amazing. Again, you know what uh, you can do in in recovery, and uh, you know, as Seneca uh, uh, philosopher uh, kind of presented, you know, I'm lucky in the sense uh, that you know. Uh, I try to be as prepared as I can when I met with an opportunity. You know, luck is the place where preparedness meets opportunity. Uh, so I've been very fortunate, I've been very blessed, but I've also, uh, I, I've been working very hard the last decade or so. Um, and so that's a little bit about me. Hello. That's wonderful. I can't wait to have you back to campus so that you can be in some of our chemistry classes too. Yeah, yeah. Carol. That would be <laughs> hilarious to, my, uh, my younger sister, I'm sorry, my younger sister, um, graduated uh, Kennebunk High a couple years ago and her senior year, her big class was chemistry and she asked me to come down and, and help tutor her. And <laughs> I was like, okay, well, uh, where's your book? And she was like, my book? And I was like, 
yeah, your book. And she was like, oh, let me go get it. And I was like, all right. And she came down and it was still in the plastic. Oh no. I was like, oh God, she got an 85 on her exam. She passed and she, she has it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like, oh God. <laughs> but uh, so students, please open your books, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Nick, how about you? Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for your help getting this going, Jennifer. And Andrew, thank you so much for, uh, for being here with us tonight. Um, just talking to you on the phone and, and getting a few other meetings going. It just the story is just remarkable. And um, a little bit about me. I've, I've been in uh, education for the last 15 years. This is my first year at Austin Prep. Um, I was teaching at a few independent schools around uh, New England before that, and um, I graduated from uh, Colgate University and uh, in an undergrad, and then um, Leslie University with the clinical mental health counseling uh, graduate degree. So that's just a little bit about me. Excellent. And Jessica? Yeah. Hi, everybody. So I'm Jess Lency. I'm the middle school counselor at Austin Prep. This is my sixth year. Um, so I'm very closely connected to all the middle schoolers and then also all of the kids who've traveled on to the high school as well. Um, so I've been at Austin six years. I've been in school counseling for the past almost 20, I think. Um, and I also went to Leslie, same um, program is Nick and I'm a Mainer as well. I know Andrew, you are only by college, but I'm a true Mainer um, <laughs> by birth. So, um, and a Vermonter by college. So um, yeah, that's a bit about me. My wife's a Mainer too, so. Nice. <laughs> I've been adopted, I think. <laughs> I hope. Well, um, so to, to get started, today's program, we're going to talk about the road to recovery, and we're going to navigate through some concepts of substance use disorder, or SUD, um, trauma recovery, and the understanding the emotions that drive our behaviors. Um, our goal for this program is to help educate and inform what can and should be an ongoing conversation for families and for people who may need some support during these journeys. Um, so before, um, let's see, before we get started with the pro actual program, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so there is a Q&A feature um, on this webinar. So we invite our audience to use the Q&A feature to ask questions throughout the program. If we don't get to your question during the program, we will absolutely try to get to all of the questions by the end of the program. So at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Andrew. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into it um, and uh, take you back to uh, senior year. <laughs> this is uh, this is actually uh, my senior year picture. Um, I was not able to show up for um, actual professional photos. So this was the school photo that ended up being used. Um, and uh, you can see me sporting the tie, uh, you know, football season, everybody was in a tie always. Coach Meriday would, uh, would um, have our necks if we didn't have a tie on. Um, so, uh, so there I am, um, you know, kind of half feeling like, uh, you know, I had the world by the tail um, and, you know, all these possibilities and, and uh, all this opportunity ahead of me. Uh, senior year, you can see that little uh, half of a wise Alex smirk going there. <laughs> and it's kind of saying like, I'm getting away with some stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, when I look at this picture, uh, and I actually look in, into my eyes, I can, I can uh, not only see, but I can remember back uh, that there was a lot of pain behind that uh, picture. Um, you know, I was playing football. Uh, I was an all-star football player, uh, played lacrosse as well, two-time all-star lacrosse player. I was also the, the team captain uh, my senior year. Uh, I excelled athletically. I did pretty well in school, not you know exceptional, but uh, I did well enough to uh, get into some good schools. Uh, but um, there was just so much uh, 
so much more to the story. Uh, and I think uh, one thing I'd like to convey right off, convey right off the bat is that uh, looks can be deceiving. Um, at this point in my life, um, I had uh, experienced quite a bit of uh, uh, domestic violence. Um, growing up, uh, you know, my mother did as well as she could. My father did as well as she could. Um, enter in a step parent that uh, had a different approach to things. Um, and um, it, it had left its mark. Uh, it, le it left its mark um, literally and figuratively. Um, by the time I got to my senior in high school, I'd already had, uh, um, had a, an experience where the, the police had to get involved. Um, I got beat up pretty bad. Uh, I had to completely pack all my stuff up within about uh, seven minutes and uh, ended up moving in with my father uh, for the rest of high school. Um, and at that point, uh, you know, he, he, he tried his best uh, and he tried to meet me where I was at, but uh, the damage really ha had been done, unfortunately. Um, and um, the stage had been set and I didn't really understand at the time uh, how it had been set um, and I'll get into that later, but, um, I would, uh, I would sit in class and I would get this, uh, this whiff of, of a memory, um, of, you know, that night or other nights or other days. Um, I would get, um, hints of, uh, you know, humiliating experiences and I would sit there in class and I would just get lost. Uh, I could feel my blood pressure, uh, pounding my shirt away from my neck. I thought everybody could see me. Uh, I would start sweating. I actually, um, sitting in the, the seat in class, I would get up and my whole, uh, you know, butt would be covered in a big sweat stain. Um, and it was just, uh, it, it was a very, uh, you know, one of those weird times when you're growing up, you get all this opportunity and you get all this, you know, life ahead of you, but there's also all this pressure uh, and you're starting to deal with things in a lot of ways you don't understand, you don't know how to deal with. Um, and, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that, you know, you go to Austin Prep, you know, uh, your, your parents are probably doing okay. You know, you have, uh, you know, some success to, to you know, uh, see in life. And so uh, a lot of the time, um, you know, people would kind of give you the vibe that like, oh, no, you just, just don't feel that way. You know, just stop thinking about it. You know, we don't have those problems. Oh, you got money, you know, you're going to school, you're doing well in sports. Just, you know, just focus on that. Just don't think about it. Um, just don't feel that way. And uh, I've, I've really come to understand that, uh, you know, essentially what is being said when that happens and not to shame anyone for saying something like that to, to someone else, but uh, to also, you know, challenge you to, to think about, uh, um, what might be happening at the deeper level that's out of our control. For instance, saying, uh, you know, don't blush. You know, when you're saying don't feel like that, essentially what you're saying is don't let your eyes be blue. You know, don't let uh, a smell, um, you know, trigger something in your brain that says, Ooh, that smells good or that smells bad, you know? And so, uh, I challenge everyone here that, uh, you know, has, uh, you know, said some of these, uses some of these phrases. It's not to shame you. And I'm going to get into some stuff later. Uh, it's just to help understand that, you know, um, that um, can, can build a lot of walls uh, and it can corner you. And one of the questions uh, that Nick and Jess asked me uh, outside of this was, you know, what do you say to parents? Uh, and it's really try to build as many bridges as you can and be, in, be as open as you can and as inviting as you can. And even if the, you know the, your your kids, your students, you know they don't take that opportunity. Uh, at the very least, at least you know they won't feel walled in uh, by these different you know uh, don'ts, won't you know can'ts, won't uh, stop. You know um, they'll see invitations. Uh, and I I have tried to not underestimate the power of the invitation. Uh, it is a very, very important thing. And, and I really uh, encourage everyone to, to build bridges. Let's, let's build bridges. And uh, there are enough walls, there's enough barriers to, you know, that we're going to face in life. Let's, let's try to build some bridges. But um, 
So again, looking at this picture, you know, a uh, little smirk, like, uh, you know, I got it going on. I think I got it, you know, got it all figured out. Um, but at the same time, this is, this is what I was dealing with uh, on, a, on a daily basis. On the outside, it looked okay. Uh, on the inside, it was just this um, pinball of, uh, you know, who knows what's gonna, who knows what's gonna come up next. Uh, and <clears throat> I've really, uh, I've dived into PTSD uh, and, and trauma and anxiety and depression. Um, and they, they really, they, they hold us prisoner. Um, and I, I can elaborate on that. Um, if anybody would like to, I'll make my uh, contact information available. I like to stay accessible um, because, you know, things come up and people have questions and I, I would love to cover everything in something like this in an hour, but I know it's, it's just impossible. Um, but um, <clears throat> I'll, I'll, I can dive into that as deep as you want um, outside of this, but uh, for the sake of time, I'm kind of going to move on and just say that, you know, this, this, this is a really nice uh, word bubble of kind of what was going on in my head combined with, you know, college, 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 college. And, you know, the reality of the situation is, yeah, um, college is super important. And, um, you know, it, it really, uh, it often separates, um, you know, people from, you know, uh, not, not a good life and a bad life. Um, but it can really make the difference in, you know, uh, being able to have some uh, feeling of security and feeling of relief uh, that, uh, you know, having a, a college education and then, you know, a college education uh, job um, or a college educated job uh, requires. And, you know, it's the, just the, the unfortunate reality that we live in. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's a lot of stress and uh, high school is, is, can be a tough place. Um, and so, you know, if you're talking to your kids or students, you know, please talk about this stuff, you know, talk about this stuff, because there's so much going on. There's just so much. It's so fast moving. Um, so sometimes it's really good to just slow down and be like, hey, where are you at? Um, another question that uh, Nick and Jess asked, you know, um, how do you, uh, you know, who, who did you go to um, when you were having issues? And, and, you know, was there a person? And uh, again, it was those people that were, you know, offering invitations, uh, building bridges and kind of saying like, Hey, check in, you know, like, Hey, what's up? You know, how you doing? Um, and then not just like, you know, giving me a hard time about something. Oh, you idiot. You know? And, and that's not to say like, you know, friends don't, you know, can't give each other a hard time. Like I, I love joking around and, you know, busting chops, but at the same time, you know, like match that with some, uh, with some, some real, some deep, some pause, you know, some, some, uh, some of the, you know, where you, where you feel alive, you feel the breath, you feel connected, you can pause and you just be with that. Cause there's so much of this, there's so much of this right here all the time. Life's going to give you that life is a four letter word. And so there's enough of that out there. Let's just take a minute. Pause. Now, Andrew, when you were yeah. a student at Austin Prep, um, mm -hmm. did you have a program such as a health and wellness program like we have now, you know, between Nick and, and Jess and, you know, some of our other administration and faculty who, who help support our students? Did you have something like that at the time you were here? So I want to say there were, <clears throat> there were teachers that made themselves available and, and let the students know that they were available. Um, I cannot remember anything formal. Um, and if there was, again, it was the, um, and I just, I'm just gonna call it how it was. It was you screwed up and you were, you were weak and you blew it and you can't handle it. Uh, and you, you're a loser, you know, you need help, you need help with that stuff. Oh, there must be something wrong with you. I might want to stay away from you lest I catch it too, you know? Uh, and there was this very deep stigma around any kind of, um, you know, uh, seeing or talking to anyone about, uh, you know, life 
and about uh, <laughs> what, what we're never going to get away from ever, which is ourselves, right? Uh, you know, you try to run away from you yourself and you just crash into you at that speed, literally as fast as you try to run away is how fast you're running into yourself. Um, there was this thing about, you know, you don't, you don't do that. You know, you don't talk about that. Everything's fine. Everybody's fine and just move on. Um, I do know, uh, uh, father Morris, I think it was father. I think it's father Morris. Yeah. Um, he, he was definitely, uh, someone that I'm not sure was in a, a specific, you know, mental health department. Um, but he was definitely the, the kind of a, a spoken resource. Uh, and I had a few conversations with him. I don't even know if he'll remember, but he left a mark on me. Uh, and he just helped me always feel at ease. Uh, and there were a few other professors like that uh, as well that kind of took a little bit of this away. Because um, good God, you know, when you got all, all, all this going on, um, I just wanted to... I was just yelling at myself all the time, like, shut up, like, shut up. Why can't you just shut up and let me go do this? You know, I'm, tr I'm trying to do this here. And, uh, and that's really what it came down to is that I was, I was constantly in a, in a place where um, I did not feel safe. I did not feel secure. Uh, and you know, a little bit of that, you know, like a little bit of stress, you know, that's, that's one thing. Um, but when you get, when you get put into a position where that becomes the norm, um, you can develop uh, certain habits and their defense mechanisms. And really what it comes down to is I was terrified and I found things that helped me feel safe and help me feel secure. Um, and stayed away from this idea that I can't, because that's what really developed was this just constant, like, stay away from that. Don't do that. Uh, don't even try, you know, the, the traditional, um, and again, not to shame anyone that's saying that, that has said this, you know, if you're not going to do it right, don't do it at all. Right. Okay. I won't do it because I don't know how to do it right. Cause I'm trying it for the first time or I tried it and it didn't feel like I did it right. And I see other people doing it better. So literally I'm just going to stop doing a bunch of stuff. Right. But so I, I kept hitting this wall of, I can't and I won't and don'ts. And I just felt like I was watching everyone around me connecting, right. Like plugging into this thing. And I was just like, my, my extension cord was just like, you know, just, I was right there and I could see it, you know, but I just could not reach it. I just was a little bit too far away. Um, and that persisted, that really persisted with me. Um, and again, it, it really, it brought it down to such a local level of what can I do right now to feel okay? And staying present, it's actually a lot of what I practice now, I just point it in a really healthy direction and as positive and productive a direction as I can. <clears throat> but at the time, there, there, there wasn't a lot that I felt connected to and there wasn't a lot that made that gave me the relief that I find today in other things. Um, what just extended that cord, you know, what my extension cord turned into was drugs and alcohol. Um, started with, you know, smoking a couple cigarettes, uh, vape wasn't a thing then, you know, probably would have vaped if that was the case. Um, but it started, you know, oh, I'm just going to do a little here, do a little there. Um, and before I knew it, I was like, wow, this feels good and it feels right. Uh, and it's my extension cord and that, you know, what happens when you smoke a cigarette? you know, it goes out, eventually it wears off, you know, what happens when you drink a beer, same thing, your body processes it, you, whether you want to or not, you know, that feeling wears off, and you have to come back to reality, you have to come back to sobriety, you have to come back to life. Um, and so increasingly, more and more, I fought that. And that looks like, uh, 
you know, one cigarette turned into five cigarettes, one beer turned into a 12 pack, you know, and then to shots, um, and then to, uh, just getting obliterated. Um, and you can chalk it up to, you know, uh, you know, we crushed it on the field. Now we're going to go crush it at this party. Um, you know, boys will be boys, that whole thing. Um, and, and, and there are friends that, you know, they, they did that and they went on to be okay. Um, something either changed in them after or something didn't happen to them before. Uh, but the point is, um, anyone that is doing that kind of thing is at risk of developing uh, a, that as a crutch, uh, that that becomes their only extension cord. And that is a really, really dangerous place to be. Um, and specifically, if you have a history of trauma, this can be very, very, very dangerous for you. Um, I'm gonna get into ACEs in a second, um, adverse childhood experiences and um, uh, some of the data behind that. Um, but first, I just wanna, I just wanna kinda tack down because there's so many de different definitions and, and, you know, denotations of words. Um, and it's, it's very easy to kind of hear a word and say, oh, you know, that thing. And um, it's really easy to, to hear something and have this, you know, deep connotation uh, that turns into the meaning and we'll talk, meaning and we'll talk, we'll talk about that in a minute. But so uh, there are a few different definitions of trauma that I kind of uh, appreciate or like. Uh, the first is essentially, you know, a physical trauma, such as a wound, right? Um, it's caused by an extrinsic agent. Um, the way I like to think about it is you break a bone, right? What does your body do? It heals back. And often it heals back stronger, it heals the bone back stronger than it was before, because that's what you do, right? You, you, you have this hurt your body goes to work or you go to work on it and you wound up, wind up practicing some resilience uh, and getting better in the meantime, you know, than you were before. Uh, you, st you still can be prone to injury, but you know what to do. And your body does this naturally. Your body has all the programming it needs. Well, mentally, um, it can be a lot different. And actually, uh, my uh, chemistry degrees um, capstone was diving into the actual biochemistry and the brain processes that happen when you have um, not just a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, um, you know, a concussion, which I had uh, won every single season of sports that I never told anyone about because I knew I wouldn't be allowed to play. And that was one of the only things, you know, I really felt connected to and I felt like I excelled at. Um, but this is literally just, um, you know, um, a non-physical trauma that happens, the, the processes that happen in the brain. And uh, the next slide kind of dives into that a little bit. Um, but finally, um, you can literally have just a, a purely an, an emotional trauma, you know, um, a breakup, for instance, or uh, someone, you know, says something uh, that just kind of shoots you right in the heart. Uh, in the same way, you know, inversely, um, I heard this quote one day, um, you know, when sp someone speaks from the tongue, it passes no farther than the ears. When one speaks from the heart, it enters the heart. You know, um, inversely, you can have like, a, I don't know if it's a reverse trauma, you can have things that just land, right? Well, and then you can have things that just land and you just feel it, you know, uh, these emotional traumas. Uh, and so there's kind of those three categories, you know biological, psychological, sociological. Uh, and that's kind of how the way I like to, to, to separate things into. But uh, again, at the end of the day, um, trauma is not just what happens to you. It is literally what happens in you. And I think that's really important to understand because two people, right, can witness the same thing or experience the same thing and they have completely different reactions to it. One can be totally fine, not phased, or so they say, and the other can be, you know, down for the count. Um, and, you know, one can say it's fine now, 
Uh, but then it, it was just buried and they start processing it, really processing it later. And that's when it bubbles back up. And, you know, all of those, uh, you know, should be respected as possible outcomes. And, and really, you know, take a pause to heed like what's going on when something's happening because there's a biological process that's taking place. And I'm just gonna briefly kind of walk you through. Um, so this is the presynaptic, postsynaptic neurons in your brain, this is how your brain fires. And essentially what this uh, slide shows is um, a non-physical, this is uh, you know emotional or mental trauma and how it's playing out in the brain. Essentially you have receptors that help the neurons fire uh, there are certain, you know, alkali earth metals that are released uh, when they're, you know, the channels are stimulated by glutamate or glutamic acid. Um, and there are uptake uh, enzymes that come and collect those things so that uh, the channels stay open and closed at, at the proper kinetic rates is, is really what's going on. When you have an emotional trauma or a mental trauma, non-physical trauma, all of a sudden your body just floods your brain with glutamic acid, glutamate. That ends up just slamming these, uh, these channels open, which allows all of these uh, earth metals to come in completely changing the pH in your postsynaptic neurons, which literally eventually winds up in cell death. So it kills brain cells. In the same way that they say, you know, oh, bumping your head kills brain cells, you know, smoking weed, drinking, doing whatever kills brain cells. Literally, non-physical trauma also kills brain cells. Um, and worse, so what happens is these, uh, these uh, other uh, agents come in to kind of, because uh, you go through excitotoxicity, um, they come in to kind of collect up all of this glutamate, all of this glutamic acid that's causing this huge problem because your body says, oh, there's, a, there's something wrong here. Well, it ends up going too far and the pendulum swings in the opposite direction. Well, where those postsynaptic channels were slammed open, now there's nothing getting to you know, signal them to open, so they slam shut. Same thing, pH slams back in the other direction, same outcome, cell death. Now, this is, essentially um, the, I don't wanna say the best case because cell death is not a good thing. But one of the additional, you know, secondary tertiary factors here, and you know, uh, out, outer factors here is that this ends up causing a lot of brain swelling. And what happens with brain swelling is that it impacts other functions of the brain or other, you know, systems that are in your brain and those include uh, your optical systems and your learning systems. And so when you experience a non-physical trauma, you actually begin to see things differently. It's not that you know, the information is different, but the way you are learning about what you're seeing, and we're mostly visu you know, visual creatures, uh, that all changes. And the more trauma you have and the less you're dealing with it, the more drastically your learning style and your literally your view of life is starts changing. And this is kind of what I found out by doing a bunch of review of research uh, and doing a little bit of my own um, is that this is playing out uh, not just occasionally, it's playing out a lot, a lot, a lot. So this is the uh, First of its kind, uh, Kaiser Permanente's um, ACEs study, adverse childhood experiences. Now these include, uh, you know, physical abuse, um, having a parent who went to prison or having a parent with substance use disorder, you know, sexual abuse, physical abuse. Um, and in 1998, so this is a few years ago, they did a study that uh, got about, I think, 10,000 people to reply. This is out in California. They're a gigantic hospital group. And they got like 10,000 people to reply to this. They have since done this dozens of times. They have hundreds of thousands of replies to this survey. Um, but the first survey showed that uh, 
people reported an, an ACEs score, 25% of people reported an ACEs score of higher than a two. Um, 6% reported higher than a four. Um, and that looks like, uh, you know, approximately 17 million people nationally. 10% um, of the people reported physical abuse. 20% um, and it was higher in women than men. Um, approximately 20% of respond, uh, respondents reported being sexually uh, abused in some way, fondled, touched. And uh, I have personal experience of that. And it was something that I really wrestled with, um, you know, what my role in it was, uh, how, I, how I carried it, um, what I could have done differently, uh, and how I was just going to live with that. And um, it's not something I wish on anyone. And it's happening to one in five people almost. I mean, this is, this is very prevalent. Uh, and in a lot of the work that I've done with friends of mine uh, from where I grew up, which is a really wealthy, uh, you know, suburban town uh, next to Concord, Mass, the birthplace of this great nation, you know, American, American uh, town. Almost every single person that I've talked to that has a drug or alcohol issue said, yeah as a kid, that happened. And so this is really, it's happening a lot more, a lot, a lot more than, than I think we, we realize. Uh, and it's, it's just ubiquitous in the, the recovery community as well, um, the greater recovery community. 25% um, of people reported living with someone who had a substance use disorder, um, and that is active. So they were actively witnessing um, the externalities and the immediate, um, you know, impacts of drug and alcohol overuse or misuse, uh, to the point of dependency. Um, <clears throat> almost 20% of people reported knowing that someone they live with was depressed or had mental health issues. You know, again, one in five people almost. Um, and then, uh, you know, we had, 10% of people reporting uh, physical abuse to themselves, they also reported around the same rates of seeing someone else be abused. Um, you know, mother, stepmother being pushed, grabbed, slapped, um, and so on. Um, now, people with an ACEs uh, score of four or higher, up to 12 times greater chance of developing a substance use disorder, having depression for sure, and attempting suicide. Um, I'm not happy to report that <clears throat> I had a score higher than a four and all of those things are true for me. Uh, I came to a place where, rewind a little bit, hurt my back very badly. The doctor said I was lucky I wasn't paralyzed. It was at work fortunately. So I wound up on disability for about three and a half years, which was awful, a couple back surgeries. Uh, Doctors at that time, you know, I got caught up in that whole, uh, you know, here's a bunch of pills, you just take pills and they make you feel better and you can go about your life. Got caught up in that. Uh, and then it was around the same time that uh, people were starting to ask questions that um, the doctors were like, oh, we're just gonna cut you off uh, with no warning. Um, here's your last script, you might wanna take a few less a day. And I had been, uh, you know, highly, highly relying on these, this medication to live. Um, what they don't talk about and what they have been talking about recently, you know, we, we, we dove into the biopsychosocial, right? What they don't talk about is that uh, a lot of these medications, um, they treat your physical pain, right? But they also treat the psychological pain and the sociological pain. So they treat a lot, or at least mask, I don't say treat, that's probably the wrong word. They mask pain, they mask your mental trauma, and they mask your emotional state. So things just get pushed down further and further and further. Uh, and for me personally, uh, the physical, um, you know, back injury, uh, it left me in a place where literally, uh, some days I had to crawl to the bathroom. Uh, and then when I got there, I couldn't even go because I was just sitting on the bathroom floor crying in so much pain. Um, living like that for a little while, it, uh, it makes you really uh, not want to go on living. 
Um, it uh, is a prison that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Um, and I do a lot of, uh, you know, yoga, meditation, stretching, exercise now to kind of um, keep myself uh, balanced, you know, my back in check in a way and strong and healthy. Um, but um, again, there's the psychological and sociological and sometimes the, the psychological and the sociological prisons, you know, that, that you can be in are worse. Because, you know, I could look at an MRI and say, hey, look, I got these two completely crushed discs and the four above it are bulged. You know, there was no MRI to look at or no x-ray or whatever to look at and say, hey, I got all this trauma going on here. My emotions are a mess. Um, and, you know, people just thought you were being a baby. You know, you're being weak. Um, you're, you're not tough enough. You, you don't have the right stuff. And again, you know, that just spins the, the wheel and, and keeps you in the, uh, the cycle of uh, pain. And, and again, um, puts you in a place where uh, you, you, you can be exposed to even more trauma, right? So I, again, went back to what was uh, giving me feelings of security. That was street drugs, right? And now I'm out doing drug deals with people. Um, and, you know, almost got stabbed a few times and a couple of knives pulled on me. Um, bricks were, you know, uh, around uh, sometimes in stories, uh, running from the cops, you know, uh, thinking I was a, a gangster down in South Boston in Charlestown, you know, thinking I'm cool. I had a completely different accent, you know. Um, but, um, you know, this, this um, I guess, uh, societal stigma around these issues, it just stacks and stacks and stacks. And before you know it, you can be in a completely different place, uh, living a life that you did not expect to live. Uh, and then by the time you're there, you're looking back on, whoa, how did I get here? And whoa, how do I get back? And um, that, can be a, that can be an overwhelming hill, hill to try to climb. It really can. And so you see a lot of people, they just keep going on, a lot of overdoses, you know, uh, we're seeing record rates still, you know, this past year with COVID increasing horribly. Um, but to kind of get back to the slides here, um, ACEs scores correlated with uh, and, and causally linked to uh, smoking and general poor health conditions. Uh, people with a four, uh, an ACEs score of four or higher also reported having more than 50 sexual partners which is, is incredible. Um, and that's a whole nother uh, layer to add on to, um, you know, possible areas of, uh, of trauma and, you know, things to unpack uh, later. But um, when, you, when you start looking at a lot of the data that's been collected, it, it becomes, uh, you know, very, very clear, very quickly that um, <clears throat> something is going on and we need to do something differently. Um, what just happened here? Oh, okay. Um, and so, oh, we're at 745. So I'm going to start blasting through some of this. We can get to uh, some, of the, some of the other stuff I want to talk about here. Uh, we have taken full weekends to do uh, messaging trainings. Um, but I wanted to really touch on, you know, the words we use, how powerful they are. And, um, you know, essentially... Uh, how even simply the words we use, um, you know, in terms of the way we look at the world, right? They define our reality. You know, these words, they, uh, they're the perimeter of ideas, right? And as far as I'm concerned, ideas are the deadliest thing on this earth. Not the wars, not the drugs, not the guns. It's the idea. Because, um, the ideas persist. You can uh, you can stop a war. You can put down a drug. You can you know put a gun on safe. But uh, once an idea is out there, it it will go and go and go, uh, and it will not stop. And we've seen that here. Um, 
in, in our community, if you just look around. Um, but in short, um, the words that we use to describe things, right? Uh, whether we know it or not, they're setting the tone and setting the personal stage for the way we look at the world. Uh, and again, the words become these emotions, these words become meanings. They're no longer, you know, there's the word and the denotation of the word. And oh God, just go on uh, any social media and watch uh, people misusing words and spelling things wrong. Uh, denotations are not there. Uh, but also, you know, um, th there's, they're using it in a way that, that is trying to impact someone and it are, has already impacted them. And so I really like to slow down and talk about how, you know, the words we use um, become meanings and then they become at a, at a larger stage and a larger scale stigmas. And stigma in action is a very, very deadly thing. Again, this idea that's trans transmitted and shared between a few people and then all of a sudden, uh, you know, what we saw for a very long time is, you know, people, uh, not getting access to treatment services, not getting access to education, healthcare, you know, fill in the blank, the, the list can go on and on and on. Um, and, it, and it essentially robs people of life opportunities and again, puts them in a position to have future traumas, right? And the, 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 really the word to describe all that is it becomes discrimination. Uh, and I experienced that personally, um, being an IV drug user, because I my my story ended up in um, with you know IV drugs uh, and attempted overdose, uh, and going through detox, you know, a handful of times and treatment and you know sober living and trying to climb my way back up. And you're just treated very differently. Even just having someone else there in the emergency room with you, you're treated completely differently. If no one else is there to witness it, it's just, and, and not to say anything bad about, you know, our medical professionals, I love them, they saved my life, but it's just, you're treated so differently when you go and you present uh, with, with or without someone else there. Um, and so I, you know, I invite you to and challenge you that are, that are on this, you know, to, to ask yourself maybe how you've been stigmatized, how it's made you feel, um, and how it's changed your lens on the world. And you know, we all have an opportunity to stop that in its tracks and do something differently. Um, exploration of concepts, I'm going to touch on this quickly because we're now at, you know, 15 minutes, under 15 minutes. Substance use disorder is a diagnosis based on uh, impaired control, social impairment, risky use, and pharmacological criteria. They split it up into mild, moderate, and severe cases. <clears throat> um, it is a broader uh, definition than, you know, addiction, um, because, um, we've learned a lot in the last, uh, few decades. Um, our DSMs have, uh, you know, in our science and our, our research ability, uh, has come a long way. Um, and so I highly recommend everybody if they, if they'd like, you know, go on to the substance abuse and mental health services website and check out, um, you know, their definition, the new definition of substance use disorders, why they have it listed as such, um, and mental health disorders. Um, and more importantly, they're not more importantly, but as important. I'm gonna skip that. Although pizza is delicious. And I had an awesome story about, you know, helping you understand what uh, substance use disorder feels like. Um, but we don't have time for that, unfortunately. Um, more of the stories, I might be having pizza in the next 24 hours. <laughs> um, we'll have you back again for another webinar too, if we can't yeah. cover everything, Andrew, don't you worry. So much. So much. <laughs> and we'll have you here to campus to try one of our pizzas. That would be great. <laughs> um, so uh, they've also redefined the term recovery. And I think this is so important because uh, a lot of people think recovery, right? They have uh, a connotation uh, and it ends in a meaning of sobriety. Uh, and that has been, uh, I think, really hurtful and harmful to uh, overall health and wellness because you don't necessarily uh, have to be sober 
to have a full and uh, you know beautiful life. And also, if you're in a place where you are highly dependent on substances, the thought of sobriety is sometimes just unachievable. If you're in a place of crisis where, again, your security is really localized, it's not long-term stability-wise, you know, the idea of not having some resources is terrifying. It's just absolutely terrifying. However, if you're presented with this idea of, hey, let's break this down into baby steps, right? The, uh, the image of the ladder going into the sky, right? And there's one guy who's, you know, the first step is like way, way above his head. And he's reaching as, as far as he can. And he, he just can't, you just can't reach it. And then next to him is another ladder with all these teeny tiny little steps. And this person's just up the ladder, up the ladder, up the ladder. But if you can break it down into some, you know, manageable pieces that may or may not end up in sobriety, may or may not end up in abstinence. Um, but to start somewhere. And for me, that looked like literally dragging myself into a suboxone clinic and, and begging the doctor to help me do something different. You know, asking my brother-in-law for help getting numbers for detox, you know, um, talking to my mom and saying, hey, listen, I can't do this alone. You know, just little things that we're along a process of change through which I improved my health and wellness, eventually learned how to live a self-directed life. You know, I'm about to be a CEO. What? <laughs> That's pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, and every day I wake up and I'm like, yo, what can I go crush? Like I'm five, five 30. I'm like, yo, the day is the day started. Let's go do some stuff. You know, like let's, let's do this. Let's get rolling. Um, and I, I'm so glad I found this definition of recovery because it really helped change my view on my life and my reality and go out and do some cool stuff. Focuses on health, home, purpose, and community. Uh, and that's what um, SAMHSA is really trying to push. Uh, and, and eight dimensions of wellness within this. So we have these pillars, uh, we have dimensions, and they're broken down again, you know, your environment, your emotions, finances, your social circle, spirituality. So, um, oh man, a couple slides later, I wanted to talk about, you know, how I found my breath. Uh, I actually have a 3D map of the lungs. And man, finding my breath and breathing, I did some breath work, literally in meditation, but finding my breath was just such amaz an amazing experience. Um, and that's one of the things that really helps. That's my extension cord now. It's just like feeling alive, letting the breath fall into me and fall out of me. It's just such an amazing thing. But if you actually flip over the 3D map of the lungs, it looks exactly like a tree. And then you start putting these connections together where you're like, oh, wait a second. The trees exhale what I inhale. And what I exhale, the tree inhales. Well, that's pretty neat. You know, uh, maybe there's a bigger system going on here. And maybe suddenly my, what I think of as, you know, me is actually a little bit bigger than just me. And maybe I'm connected to these other systems and these other things that are going on in the world. And suddenly I feel like, oh, I have a place in the universe. I'm not just getting kicked around, you know, being bullied by life. Like I'm connected to this thing. I'm helping. I'm working with it. I'm not working at it. It's not working at me. You know, we're doing something together. Um, and, uh, I love get it, getting into the definition of, uh, you know, spiritual and how it, uh, actually comes from a Greek word that literally means aspire, which is to breathe. Uh, and then, uh, you know, linking it to, uh, there's a Sanskrit word for exhale, which, uh, actually, well, the Sanskrit word for nirvana really is to blow out, <sighs> you know? And it's just to exhale. And so, you know, you're breathing in hope, you're breathing in spirituality, you're exhaling nirvana, you know, and suddenly you're making these connections. It's just like, oh my God, you know, things are actually pretty good. You start, you know, finding what you're grateful for uh, instead of feeling kicked around and focusing on what's beating you up. And not to say, don't focus on what's beating you up. You know, give it heed, say hello, ask it what message it has and, and why it's there and what, what it's bringing. Um, but, uh, grow and learn and make connections and, and, and 
and have this, uh, you know, have a blast. You know, there's this whole life out there to live. Uh, and you can do it without the help of drugs and alcohol. And there's plenty of people out there that, again, are your bridges, they're your resources. We want to help. We want to see you succeed. And I personally have been in a lot of rough places. And uh, I have a lot of experience transitioning out of those places. So please see me as a resource. Uh, I'm at your service and uh, I'm your hum I'm at your humble servant. Please uh, utilize me. But with that, I'll stop because it's uh, it's 7.53. That, that time passed pretty quickly. Sorry. Just talking quite a bit there. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Take a breath. Have a yeah. drink. <laughs> I think, um, Jess, Nick, you you have some questions, I think, and and uh, I'm not sure if there's anything in the Q and A here too. But um, mm. if if you're you're open to it, Andrew will ask you a few questions here. Yeah, please. You want me to go first, Jess? Yeah, great. Okay. Um, Andrew, thank you so much. That that was that came across and uh, just thinking about what we were talking about earlier just your presentation of it and and hearing the the story itself it, it really inspirational and and I think that the audience and our students uh, would would gain a lot um, from all of them hearing it um, and I, I think for Jess and I in our roles as, as counselors at the school um, thinking about how counseling um, has had a role in your life um, where I guess did it did it fit in for you first, and uh, was there any resistance there um, mm -hmm. when you were thinking about oh do I have to go talk to somebody and like is that is that what my life has led to now and because mm -hmm. yeah. I know that that is a hesitation for our students and the stigma it persists um, and that's something that we're trying to work with yeah and. Um... Let me start off by saying uh, I did resist. Um, and um, I actually started going to a counselor before um, I even stopped using. Uh, I hadn't even considered stopping using. Uh, and my mom was like, I'll pay for it. Just show up. Just show up, please. And I was like, I'll do it for you, but that's it. I'm not doing this for me. And after the first few, uh, um, sessions i was like did you hook me up with a drug and alcohol counselor <laughs> she was like no I just wanted you to talk to someone um but um it, it planted little seeds you know and it was a slow process uh, come to find out that uh, the more honest i was with her the more i got out of it um and um i think a huge part of me um didn't really understand that um, you're, you're bound by the law to not talk about anything, um, outside of, you know, you hurt, trying to hurt yourself or others. Um, and, um, uh, that I didn't really understand that this, this was a place where I could just, um, really, uh, explore those, those deep, dark places inside of me that, uh, never see the light of day, uh, that I run from and that, um, that stay dank and dark. Um, and this, it was a safe place for me to, to just, um, just put it out there. Not even if anything happened, you know, or some profound knowledge was gained, it was just, you know, some light which was shined on it. Uh, and that started the process and that was enough. Um, in terms of resistance um, to it, and, and I'll fast forward briefly. Uh, I actually found my roommate uh, overdosed and dead uh, in recovery. I had a little over a year. He had almost uh, six months. And um, I was in school at the time. Um, it was a horrible, horrible experience. Um, I was the one that called his mom. Um, and um, I was lucky enough to have uh, university health care uh, and counselors right there. Uh, that I could go see. And they said straight up like, Hey, listen, you're only allowed eight sessions a semester, but we don't care. We'll make it work. If you want to come in here and talk to us, we will. Um, so it's even interesting that someone could have an experience like that and be, 
and, and still be, you know, have to work around rules, you know, so it's not just, uh, you know, societal stigmas, it's actually policies sometimes that, uh, that get in the way of people getting, you know, access to care. And again, that goes back to stigmas in action. But um, in terms of resistance, um, I like sharing the story, uh, a friend of mine, um, he did a couple tours in Iraq. Um, and uh, he came back and he, he was he was not doing well for for many years. Um, and one day I'm on the phone with him and he starts talking about, uh, you know, his, his counseling. And he said that, um, yeah, you know how I look at it now, Andy? He's like, you know, you brush your teeth every night, right? And I was like, yeah, I try to brush my teeth in the morning, you know, twice a day, right? Floss, you know. He's like, yeah, you know, you got your oral hygiene routine, right? He's like, but what do you do twice a year, right? Ideally, and this took a long time for me to get to get to, but you go for a cleaning twice a year, right? You go see a professional to get your teeth clean because as much as I'd like to think that I have it going on with my, my, my oral health, right? I can still develop a cavity. And sometimes I don't even know it, right? They do x-rays, they get down into the, you know, underlying the, the top layers and they can see things that maybe I can't. And he's like, that's, that's how I look at uh, my mental health now. It's my mental hygiene. He's like, uh, I do things now that include going to see someone to talk, you know, a professional to talk about uh, things that I might not see or that my significant others or, you know, the friends that sometimes I choose because I know they'll co-sign what I'm saying or, you know, I, I answer shop occasionally, <laughs> you know, like um, this, you know, mental health professionals, um, not to say they're mean, but uh, they can be honest and they can help us, you know, see things that we don't. Uh, and that's an, an incredible, incredibly important part of having a, a hygiene routine. Um, and now being able to really like identify the, the or, you know, oral hygiene, the mental hygiene of, um, you know, seeing a counselor, it's, it's really beneficial and it's really important. And uh, I currently am not seeing anyone but um, there, ha you know, there were the first few years, especially after um, finding my roommate. Uh, I, I, the whole time I was at uh, in college, uh, in grad school, I was seeing someone, uh, and then prior, um, and I, and I t I share with people that you know you think you're doing great, you know why not do better? You know we it, well, we you can do better with a mental health counselor. And actually, Bryn, my wife, uh, she uh, has been encouraging me to go see someone again. And uh, I think it's time. I don't, I don't know why I'm, I've been, I've been balking at it, but uh, I know it works and it's, and it's really helpful. And I encourage everybody out there to, to utilize resources if you have them. Thank you. Just That's a great question. Yeah. It is a great question. Um, thank you so much. This has been so, it's so wonderful to see you just like share and be vulnerable. And, you know, the openness is like if for all the kids who will watch this, it's like such a great model mm. um, for an adult. I was, I, I didn't, we didn't plan this before, but I wonder what you thought. It won't be too tough a question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Nick and I, the, the most uh, honestly some of the most common ways we find out about kids struggling are their friends mm. and I was thinking about if you think back to high school and I know you talk about like boys will be boys and you were crushing it on the field and after you mm. know what do you think would have happened if or maybe one of your friends did try to intervene or how do you feel about that in terms of like friends responsibilities to their friends mm. Um, so I should mention I've had two inter in two interventions, um, both of which were motivated by friends. Mm -hmm. um, hated them at the time. <laughs> uh, and they saved my life. They saved my life. Um, th th it is always a difficult uh, situation to be in, um, knowing that someone is struggling with something that that you know either they aren't they they can't or won't deal with uh and uh being able to kind of see uh a system playing out 
where you know there's a lot of bad stuff happening and you can probably see where it's coming from um there are ways um i'm you, sure you've heard of motivational interviewing um not that you know every high schooler should be trained in motivational interviewing but there are ways to kind of present questions uh to people to get them um to maybe you know even accidentally stumble upon <laughs> you know an answer that you were trying to get to or you know uh not be the one to go beat someone over the head with you know what what you're trying to say um and 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 that's actually a great lesson for parents to uh, again not to shame anyone for for you know saying hey this is screwed up you got to fix it you know there has to be some accountability in a healthy relationship there has to be boundaries there has to be some structure um but uh you know approaching someone that's having an issue or, or it's it's causing you a problem or someone else a problem uh, is a delicate situation. I'd highly recommend seeing you, Nick, or you, Jess, uh, to talk out a, a plan. Because uh, at the end of the day, having a plan going in, not just, uh, you know, I'm going to go say this to them, you know, um, which, you know, might happen and it might work out, it might not, you know, and, and not to shame anyone that has done that. But uh, having a plan and, you know, being thought out and, um, not going in by yourself, you know, having a few people with you or um, at least, you know, um, being thoughtful uh, and, and, and really, uh, I don't want to say putting them first, you know, because, uh, you know, that uh, I feel like often leads to people just letting, you know, letting people off the hook, for lack of a better term, but um, trying to put yourself in their position. And say, you know, if I was them, how would I want to be talked to? How would I want to be approached? Um, how, what would be meaningful to me? And if I can extrapolate that to, you know, what came through in the interventions and what really happened uh, prior to that and after that and during, um, it was essentially um, people people kept saying overtly and like directly, but also kind of in in other words, Andrew, we know this isn't you. We know this isn't you, you know, we know you, we know Andrew and this isn't you dude. Like what, what's going on? Like what, are, what's going on? And that again, it, it identified that there's this issue. It identified that there's a problem, you know, and it held me accountable to that, but it wasn't like you loser screw up, you know, fill in some hard nouns, junkie liar, you know, and it didn't feed that, internal monologue that I already had going where I was a loser, you know, fill in four letter words, four letter words, you know, horrible, you know, the, the, uh, the, the rat race that, that you can get into. It didn't feed that. It helped me put that aside and be like, yeah, yo, I'm actually not that person. What, what the hell is going on? You know, why do, why did I act like that? And it helped me stop and think about, you know, the bigger the bigger system at, at play uh so um i don't know if that exactly answers your question but um yeah thank you yeah also go see jess and nick <laughs> 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 well we're a couple minutes past the hour um we might have time for maybe one more question or so and as i said andrew hopefully we'll have you back again um whether it's virtually and in person to to do some more work with us um because i think um your humility amazing um but jess nick do you have another uh, another question maybe one last question here for andrew yeah want to end on the light note and ask about um <laughs> We were wondering about best memory. Favorite me. memory? That's a good. <laughs> it's not gonna be senior prank. <laughs> um, actually, I love this question because it took me on a real trip through high school, um, or at least two years at Austin Prep, uh, that I uh, that I served. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, uh, sports um, were definitely a highlight for me. Um, Working with Coach Meredith and, and earning a, a starting position uh, on the team was really was really great. Um, 
<laughs> literally the the first few uh captain's practices my junior year uh a couple of the other players were like listen Kazulis, if if you don't if you just quit right now and you don't show up for anything else we won't say anything we won't give you a hard time we'll still talk to you at school like we'll pretend like this never happened and you cannot have to play football and we'll just it'll be great <laughs> so i walked in terrified and i was not in shape and coach meriday will get you in shape very quickly <laughs> um so uh you know uh, after a few weeks working on onto the squad, that was that was really uh, a great memory. But also, um, you know, lacrosse uh, senior year, we made the playoffs. We were dead last, uh, and we played the number one seed Hingham. Um, we ended up playing 42 out of 48 minutes on defense. I can remember literally uh, running with one of the attackmen, dry heaving because I was out of vomit. Um, you know, towards the third and fourth quarter, um, and we lost eight to two. And they weren't like playing their third, fourth stringers. They were like, they were actually like trying to beat us bad. They wanted to get goals. They wanted to like get momentum. You know, they were, they were being pretty nasty. Uh, and we lost eight, two. That was, that was a really probably the best defeat I've ever had. Um, and then scholastically, um, I actually won a science Olympiad in, in chemistry. Uh, there was a standardized exam. Um, I loved chemistry and I was trying to remember uh, the chemistry professor's name and I, it escaped me. I want to say her, her first name was Elizabeth or, uh, but oh Ms. man. Farrell. Farrell. Miss Farrell. Yes, Miss Farrell, yes. <laughs> oh my God. Um, she was one of my favorite teachers. Uh, and I just fell in love with chemistry back then. Um, and that whole, that whole year was just, uh, was really great. Um, and, uh, you know, winning the Science Olympiad was, oh, I also won friendliest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, you were in superlatives, weren't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we were in superlatives. Uh, so that was cool too. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, lots of good memories though, lots of good memories. But we had a couple of comments more than more than questions in the Q and A. Um, mm -hmm. One of your classmates, Jill, said um, she's so proud to be your classmate and so proud to be your friend. So very Thank touching. You, Jill. And then we have another another alum um, who said he um, he thanks you for sharing um, your experience as well as congratulations on nine years of sobriety. He's celebrating thirty two years last week. So, oh wow! Sky's the limit, he says. May babies, oh. I like it. Shake and bake. Good. Okay, <laughs> Congratulations so, as well. Well, um, thank you again, as I said, for for sharing such great information um, um, for everyone here, and it, um, I also want to say thank you for sharing your personal story um, in a way that. I think will provide some hope and some optimism for so, so many people. Um, and we're looking forward to having you back here to campus, um, whether it's in Miss Farrell's chemistry class or here in the dining hall to have some pizza. Um, so, and um, back to a little bit of housekeeping um, for our audience and for you folks. Um, our next webinar in this Austin Prep Present series um, is next, um, next Tuesday. Tuesday, May 25th, and it's finding Veritas, Unitas, and Caritas in the game of golf for families. And this is with uh, the class of 1980 alum Bob Baldessari of the PGA of America and Reimagine Golf. And he's bringing along his colleague, Emmanuel Casio of Golf for Kids Kenya. Um, Bob is going to share his journey um, of taking the Augustinian values of Veritas, Unitas, Caritas onto the golf course um, with his time spent growing the game uh, for youth and family golf with the PGA of America and creating opportunities for underserved populations across the world, including in Kenya, um, to learn to play the game of golf helping nonprofits use golf as a tool to fundraise and to create an emotional connection to the mission. Um, Pat Driscoll, who is our director of athletics and summer programs, and also an alum from the class of 1997 is going to host Bob and Emmanuel um, for what 
I imagine will be a very entertaining and educational <laughs> webinar. So, um, and for anybody interested in seeing some of our previous Austin Prep Presents um, programs and to watch recordings, you can visit our website at austinprep.org or any of our social media pages. Um, so again, Jessica, Nick, Andrew, thank you so, so much um, for sharing the evening with me and with our audience. And I will look forward to doing this again soon. Thanks for having me. Thank you, everybody. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night.